Okay, hi everyone. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Victoria Lim. I'm a PhD student in the Mobley Lab at UC Irvine. And today I will be sharing about my benchmark assessment of molecular geometries and energies from various small molecule force fields. Okay, so um, given that this is a force field meeting, I don't need to really emphasize um, the importance of force fields and specifically good force fields, but just to focus our attention a little bit this morning. So let's say you have um, a small molecule in a protein binding site and you're trying to gain some insight out of this um, system. So the way, the insights that you will gain from looking at um, a ligand in a binding site will really be determined by how quality, how good that force, that ligand is represented in terms of its force field. Specifically, um, we might wonder a few questions such as, what geometries can a certain molecule adopt? And secondly, what is the energy difference between two conformers? Which conformer is a more energetically stable one? And being able to represent these small molecules accurately in just plain vacuum without a complicated protein environment is important in order to really put these back into more complicated environments such as solution or, or a protein or a membrane to really draw insights and actually do chemistry and do science um, from these tools. So just to present a high level view of my workflow so you can get an idea of what's going on. So we extract the molecule set and prepare that from QC archive. This has over 26,000 uh, molecular structures. Then we group conformers together. So everything that has the same molecular connectivity, so we're just looking at a toy example of methane here, will be considered as the three different conformers of one parent molecule. So let's say we have this um, Q, little icon representing QM conformers. Next, we will perform energy minimizations with various force fields. So each force field starts from the same initial structure as the QM optimized geometry. So let's say you know, these teal, purple, and yellow colors are three different force fields. And we also we have the same starting geometry with the QM. And then finally, we compare the force field results against the QM reference. So if we take, if we want to analyze conformer number two, we can compare that with conformer number two for each force field, and we can look at energetic differences and sort of see how their geometries uh, match up. So let's say we have some structure here. This is the QM structure. We, in this work, we're looking at the general amber force field, GAF and GAF2. We're looking at the Merck molecular force fields, Merck 94 and 94S, which differ by um, slight changes in how nitrogens are represented. And then finally, we're looking at some force fields that came out of the Open Force Field Initiative, which are Parsley um, and Smirnoff 99 Frost. So just as an overview of my results, um, I'll be talking a little first about energies, and then I'll be sharing about geometries, and then we'll look at them together and then identify specific chemical moieties that can be used for um, future force field refinement. Okay, so first, we compute relative energies between the force fields and the QM results. So the way we do that is by taking, for some conformer I, we take that its energy and then we subtract it from a reference conformer. So the reference conformer is defined to be the same conformer for all the different force fields and for the QM. And the, we choose a reference conformer by identifying which conformer set so for example, if this blue, um, in, in this blue uh, rectangle here, let's say maybe the, the reference, the lowest energy is this first one. So we'll say this is the first, the first conformer will be the lowest energy that will be reference zero. And that will apply that reference for all force fields. So um, with this, we have histogrammed the, the change in conformer energies in this um, histogram plot here. And so we see that, um, there are a few different tiers around DDE equals zero, so the, the change in conformer energy. So ideally, um, a perfect force field that completely reproduced the quantum, uh, quantum conformer energy difference would have just a really high peak at zero and very low um, uh, histogram um, tails otherwise. So we, here we see that um, generally GAF and GAF2 are the highest around zero, and then followed by, um, and Parsley is up in here too, it's um, sort of hidden among the blue. Um, and then we have Merck molecular force field 94 and 94S, and then we can see Smirnoff. So you can see that Parsley um, truly does improve upon Smirnoff. And then um, something that's pretty obvious in this graph is that there is asymmetry in terms of if a force field overestimates 
which would be on this side, or underestimates um, the conformer energy, especially with Smyrna fine, fine frost, which has the highest um, difference between um, the, the left and right sides. Okay, so um, we decided to extend our energetic analysis further, um, thinking that so a, a certain force field, like if you have a, a certain set of structures um, and they all start from the same structure, they will not always minimize to the same structure. So you might have um, some of some redundant geometries in your conformer set. So we want to say, okay, given that we have uh, matching conformers, then what are the relative energies of, between different conformers? So we match all conformers re with respect to a QM reference within one angstrom RMSD, and then we compute the mean sign deviation of energy. So just taking the force field energy minus the QM energies. So this is very analogous to the histogram that I showed in the last slide, but this is just um, one with match conformers and two now looking at the mean sign deviation. So you can um, see that in a little bit more clearly. So this is on log scale. And if we're showing the different force fields here, you can see that they're all very similar. It's hard to distinguish any differences, but you do see that there is um, the median of all these points is below zero, also um, reflecting that asymmetry that we see in um, the force field results. So just to zoom in on this a little bit more, if we overlay all the different force fields as in here, and then we zoom in, we can see that um, we see the blue, orange, and purple curves being on the outside. So these are normalized by area. So each area is the same for, um, for all the force fields. Then we can see that um, these are slightly better because we would like ideally to see a, a much broader distribution at zero and then very um, low amounts of data in, in the tail regions at high and low conformer energy. Okay, so we're going to change um, focus a little bit here to talk about geometries and then we'll take a look after that about how they relate to each other. Okay, so in this work, we're looking at two different metrics to evaluate geometry, and one is RMSD that um, is generally more well known and more well used. Um, but another thing that we're looking at is called TFD, which is torsion fingerprint deviation. Now, the reason that we want to look at TFD is that our RMSD has been known to correlate with molecular size. And when we want to identify outliers and structures, we don't want um, you know, artifacts and just, okay, this is a large molecule, that's why it has a high, high RMSD. We want to identify the molecules that are um, truly less consistent with the QM structure. So torsion fingerprint deviation takes a Gaussian weighted difference of the torsion angles between two conformations, and it um, weights it such that the internal torsion has a stronger contribution to the score than the external angles. And um, it's all normalized from zero to one. So a high TFD is less, um, basically it represents less agreement um, just with RMSD, except RMSD is unbounded. And a low, RMS, low RMSD is like a low TFD where, where that signifies more agreement. So we hope that this is more independent of molecular size in order to basically compare two geometries. So the results for the RMSD and TFD analysis are histogrammed on the left side here, and we see a couple of different things. So uh, we see that once again, parsley does improve um, compared to Smyrna 99 frost. We can see a reduction in this tail region here, as well as an increase um, in the in the peak. And then we see this trend also between RMSD and TFD, and that both. RMSD and TFD plots are very similar, but we see that once we control a little bit better for molecular size, that um, the, the MMFF 94 and 94S are a little bit more consistent with each other and they do a little bit better than the rest of the force fields in this work. And we can take a look at specific uh, parameters that uh, are in these outlier regions to focus our efforts on improving force fields moving forward. So the way we do that is by identifying, um, if we take all the structures, like so here we have three different conformers that are represented in the, in the tail region of the RMSD or TFD plot, how we can ask ourselves, how, what is the fraction of this parameter in just that tail region? And then what is the fraction of param this parameter in the whole set? So if we have, 
in this, um, in the RMSD and TFD plots, each conformer was considered separately. So we're plotting each individual structure. But when we're actually doing this analysis, we say, okay, if we see this conformer three times, but this molecule is only here once, and if this molecule has a certain number of um, uh, repetitions of that particular parameter, it just counts once. So here, you know, for these three conformers in this, small, in this all these um, parameters, B83 would count one time. So we can get something, um, just a series of bar plots that really show us, okay, um, if, if a parameter is above one, then that is overrepresented in terms of the tails of the RMSD or TFD. And these might be the parameters that we wanna focus on. For example, um, these bonds or um, these Van der Waals parameters or these angles. Um, but so now we're gonna um, turn, our little, or turn our focus to looking at relative energies versus geometries. So here, basically, we, we've looked at the geometries and energy separately. Now we're just looking at them together. Is there a relationship um, between the energies and geometries? And the short answer is not directly. So we would, you know, if, if there were a direct relationship, you might see sort of um, a, a linear result where we see, okay, if we have, you know, better if we have worse geometries, which would be more on the right-hand side, we would have you know, a higher spread of energies, but that is actually not the case when we're seeing that um, all the force fields have generally similar distributions. So and when we're looking at this DDE versus TFD plot, um, a, a force field that has really good agreement to the quantum mechanical data will have a high density of points at zero, zero. So here I'm using colors to represent the density of points since um, we have over 20,000 points in this plot, so it's hard to see individual ones, so we're using color as a way to denote the density. So if we look at all the force fields together, we can see um, just on linear scale, on first glance, there's not a ton of difference. We can see that um, there's a concentration uh, in MFF, MMFF 94, um, which is, has the darker blue region around zero, zero. And then we can also clearly see that Smirnoff 99 frost is much more spread out in terms of its energies, which is along the y-axis, as well as the x-axis, which is the geometries, which is consistent with what we are seeing in the previous 1D plus. Now we we're just looking at it as individual points. But just to get a better sense of what's going on in that central region that we care about, we can look at this result on a log scale as well. So we can see, okay, let's say if we compare between GAF and GAF2, we see that the high density region is uh, strongly negative as we're seeing that asymmetry and then it shifts a little bit more to be asymmetric on the DDE axis. And a similar observation is noted for MMFF94 where there's a little bit more asymmetry which gets a little bit reduced in the 94S force field. And then parsley seems to be more symmetric than the others. Um, we can see it in this blue region here. And then um, with Smirnoff 99 frost, things are just way more spread out. So there's not really a, there's a very strong concentration of points um, at, the, the, at the origin. Okay, and then if we just take a closer look at this TFD plot, so this is basically the same plot here, but now instead of looking at the density of points, we're looking at specific chemical moieties. Um, so here um, I identified a few different um, structure um, types that contribute to these outliers. So specifically, uh, we're going to start, so if we look at this salmon color points here, these are mostly represented by this octahydro tetracine compound. So um, things along this has this like four ring structure and lots of um, oxygen atoms um, substituted onto this um, scaffold. Uh, we also have this azetidine um, backbone. So basically this is looking at the four membered ring with the nitrogen here. And we see that these account for a lot of, a lot of the, the outliers in the TFD. So for example, these um, purple points here, as well as um, some of the high energies up here and down here. And then finally, we also identify um, NN compounds as their um, pretty systematic in some of the energies down here and um, a few up here as well. And um, there are lots of other points that are not highlighted here, but these are less consistent. They're more like individual structures that have uh, maybe a just very unique composition of atoms or specific geometries like a seven member ring that is not consistently um, uh, basic, uh, in, represented poorly by the force field. So we do not um, really focus on these individual points. 
Okay, so that brings me to the conclusion, and I think this is about 15 minutes. So um, at this point, I'll take any questions if you have any. Just uh, really sure whether it's a question, but the, these plots of um, differences in energy as a function of uh, uh, deviation in structure, mm -hmm, they, right. they don't seem intuitive. I mean, I don't quite grasp them. And um, as you say, one, the expectation is that one, one should get a linear kind of shift um, as, as the energy deviation increases, so, so should the, the structural deviation. Right. So, yeah. So, so what we're seeing here is, and, and this was a little bit surprising, is that um, just because we have two structures that are, so let me, let's break this down into sort of quadrants, right? So um, an upper quad, so a high TFD and high relative energy, that would be, that's what we would expect because, or, and it would be actually either of these two quadrants because um, with, with inconsistent geometries, we would expect uh, more inconsistent energies. Well, let's, and then if we, let's now turn our focus to this upper left quadrant, that is saying we have pretty good agreement in geometries, but the energies are still off. And, and then the lower left, lower left quadrant would be saying that we have pretty good agreement in, gener in um, geometries, but the energy, well, I guess we would need to do like three. Uh, so basically the high region, the middle region, and the low region. So we're seeing that it makes sense that if you have, you know, a simple uh, change in, the, in, a, in a torsion that it can still represent the conformer energy well because um, there's not much changing other than maybe that torsion angle. Um, but in fact, yeah, so when we have more changes that are not just that, that it's not always reproducing changes in the in the conformer energy and so that's that's something that's consistent among all the forces that we're looking at it it, it seems to it seems to indicate that there's something fundamentally wrong that what we should have is a force field which which should there should be a penalty every time it deviates from structure and and here we are getting a uh, we're getting large numbers in in changes in deviation in structure and yet the energy differences are are, are the same. So there's something. Do, do you see what I mean? One. So so I'm not. I'm not. This is not a question of the data that you have, the analysis you've done. It's just something much broader than that. That that something's not being represented. So really, an ideal force field should be. I mean, a, a mechanical force field should be something where the penalty is there to bring, to cause alignment of the structures. And that penalty doesn't seem to be there to bring that, bring, 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 bring them together. So we, we are getting structural deviation and yet the energies are same. Yeah, I think I mean, that's a great point. And I'm not sure if it's related to this, but one thing that, you know, Leaping has brought up in the past is that well, I mean, for one, I think I think that um, you know mostly people have taken like QM optimized geometries and you know fit to those. So I don't think looking at relative conformer energies has been something that people do very much. So you're, you're you know when it's fitting to try to get the geometries right to some extent, but. Um, and then the, you know, the energetics for me, variation around an optim a single optimized geometry. But the second area really thing is at the point that, um, you know, what you'd probably like to do is to take um, QM optimized geometries as we're doing here and make sure you get the MM energies of those right. But you'd also like to take MM optimized geometries and see what the QM energies are of those make sure you get those right because otherwise you're doing something that's a little bit asymmetric and saying Indeed, yeah. like i want to make sure my mm energies for these minima are right but i'm not actually checking that in other words i find the qm minima and i see if i can capture those but i don't check to make sure i don't have lower mm minima somewhere else i understand yeah yeah, yeah. Hmm. mark okay. i think you're muted i see your lips moving 
apologies. I was saying, is there, is there an issue trying to compare the QMN and the MM energies in that, especially for the larger molecules, your QM energies are entirely in vacuo, but your MM energies are partially in vacuo because your charge model is assuming a polarized medium. Because the charge model is A1BCC, which is a, a mimic for HS61G star, which overpolarizes the model, molecule, but everybody's happy with that because that's actually what happens in condensed phase. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, in a sense, it, it's a vacuum situation versus a partially vacuum but partially condensed phase. And especially with larger molecules that could then fold up and have intramolecular electrostatic interactions, that's going to introduce an error. I have yeah, no idea how you'd correct for that, but um, that's a good point. And I right now I don't correct for that, and you know that could ex explain some of the inconsistent energies that we see. Yeah, that's certainly and that's certainly a challenging problem because yeah, as you said, I don't. It's hard to know what the right answer is to that. I can't see any easy way of fixing it, but yeah, it, it's always going to introduce an error. So there's going to be a limit to how good you can be, I would have thought. One, one could, of course, carry out QM calculations um, in some sort of, in the same sort of dielectric that we expect to be in, in the electromechanics mechanics of the sphere. That might be an approach, yeah. yeah. Yeah, some of these issues are issues where you know, at some level, it's easy to argue that, well, the only real way to resolve some of them is to have some kind of a polarizable force field, because otherwise, you just get kind of stuck with not knowing what the right way to compare to anything is. But, but yeah, that'll remain, I think, challenging when we're dealing with fixed charge force fields. So. I wish I knew what the best thing to do is. Um, yeah, part, part of the answer, I think, is, well, you know, these issues should be bigger for larger and floppier molecules. So mm -hmm. we may want to separately look at, like, the smaller size size range. Maybe you want to break some of these benchmarks out by size eventually. I just wonder, especially molecules can do things like form intramolecular hydrogen bonds and so on. They're likely to end up being big outliers on these sort of plots. Yeah. I possibly ask one more. Uh, yeah, we have time. Uh, Victoria, you, you, you mentioned that the RMSD that comes out, that's unbounded. Is it not normal to normalize that with respect to a number of particles? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I meant that, I meant to say that between, if we're looking at a diverse set of molecules, um, the RMSD will depend a little bit more on molecular size. So, you know, a high RMSD might signify that it's a very large and flexible molecule, or I might say that, oh, it's a, it's a smaller molecule, but has a high, you know, deviation in geometries. So it's unbounded in the sense that it's not normalized between zero and one. Hmm. Okay. But, it, but it, yes, it is limited by the size of the molecule. Thank you.